Nick. Hey, Seth. How's it going? Man, another day above ground, you know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey, congratulations on Echo Boomers. You know what? I really like your directing style. It's very crisp, sharp, and beautiful. Oh, dude, man, I, I can't tell you how much of a relief that is to hear. We, we really haven't shown a lot of people, so I'm really glad that you loved it. I, I, did, I did like the movie, especially especially your pacing of, of the film. I, I was like on the edge of my seat, like trying to figure out like, like gosh, what's going to happen next? It was, it was, it was very thrilling. It was, it was great. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that like there, it wasn't a predictable, uh, it wasn't a predictable pattern. You know, when that ending happens, it almost kind of takes your breath away. <laughs> now, um, I want to know where the original idea came from, because at first, when I heard, first heard the concept, I thought you were basing the story on the bling ring of Hollywood, mm -hmm. but that's not true sure. at all. So, so where did this concept came from? Yeah, so, so um, I found this story in 2013, and I just graduated film school at Columbia in Chicago, and I was feeling like this pressure of creating my own work and you know, I had like a lot of student debt and I got to the finish line and, you know, there are no shortage of filmmakers, you know? <laughs> um, and so kind of serendipitously enough, I came across these headlines of these college kids in Chicago breaking into these wealthy homes. And like, weirdly enough, I could like relate to their frustration. Like I got it for some reason. And um, and I understood it and I understood why they were doing it. And I felt that angst and I felt that rage. And I kind of took that and out came Echo Boomers. So. <laughs> so how much research did you get into um, basically trying to figure out the perfect way to break into houses or, or is this what you would have done? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny when you think about it for so long, when you start thinking about like how to do it, it's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you spend that much time thinking about it, you kind of figure it out. But we did do a little bit of research of like um, how it normally happens and like how long you stake out a house and that type of stuff. But yeah, a lot of it was just kind of thinking about it, like what would you do type of thing. <laughs> so let's talk about the production process. One of the very first thing that you had to figure out was to get these houses. Talk about the houses, the sets that you actually brought on board. Yeah, so um, so as you saw in the movie, like some of the houses are just like ridiculous. Um, and honestly, we just found those uh, those homeowners that were just kind of like, yeah, you can use my house. That sounds great. Um, but for like the big destruction stuff, we used a stage, just because we kind of had to, right? <laughs> um, like the like the very beginning, the first break in where they like totally destroy the living room. That was that was luckily a stage because we knew that we were going to be doing so much damage. There's no way we could clean it up. Uh, but it took it took a lot of it took a lot of preparation of you know really making sure that those sets looked right. I'm a really big fan of of only shooting on set. So like shooting on a stage, I was like kind of really nervous about it because you know I know how weird it can look shooting on a set. But we spent a lot of time making sure that those sets were perfect, and I think it turned out well. <laughs> where where did you get all that stuff for for destruction i mean it, it man everywhere lost. dude our production designer was going from you know thrift shop to alleys to to uh, estate sales about everything we could find <laughs> so as a director when you were filming those scenes because whatever it is it looked like a lot of fun i i wish i was in the movie that i get to uh, you know destroy stuff <laughs> So when you yelled to roll the scenes, I mean, what, what did you let the cast do? Just, just let them do whatever they want? Or was there like specific things? Yeah. So like we kind of broke it up in two sections. Like one section was like choreographed destruction. Like things that we only, that we knew we only had like two or three really nice vases. Um, so we like kind of choreographed those out. So we made sure that it was safe and that we didn't miss it. And then kind of after that, each actor kind of got their own time to just kind of let loose, which it was like really interesting because some actors really enjoyed that. They were like, wow, that felt great. I got all this energy out. And then other actors like would break one thing and would be like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> was, was there any items that you wish it wasn't uh, destroyed on, on the set? 
<laughs> man some of them were, some of the pieces were really gorgeous like some of the some of the uh the couches and and like the the end tables and all these things were i was shocked that we could destroy them so <laughs> now one i guess at every crime spree there always has to be an art dealer or some kind of dealer that actually sells these things sure. and talk talk about putting that into your story and having michael shannon play that role yeah so our idea behind that was kind of this uh, kind of ongoing theme throughout the movie, which is pretty clear about um, about these two different generations, and you you having this kind of younger millennial uh, who's just kind of like trying to make a dollar in any way, you know, getting paid by this older generation who's kind of been through who who's already been through it, and so that was kind of our idea behind it of like kind of this age old thing of like millennials against baby boomers. And so that's kind of where that came from. <laughs> what, what, what is the most important lesson as you, you develop this story about the younger generations? Or it's just that there's some kind of generation gap that we don't know of each other. Because for myself, I'm an X generation, and I just like watching you guys war at each other. For Go. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think the biggest lesson here is like, obviously, we made a movie about millennials that go about it the absolute worst way possible, right? Um, but in reality, and hopefully at the end of the movie, this kind of comes across with Leslie and Warren talking to Patrick, but like, in reality, this generation has had a massive effect on the world. And when it comes to, to racial equality, and when it comes to, you know, uh, you know, gaps between women and men getting paid and kind of all these things and just like the regular work week, you know, the, the, the millennials have kind of changed, you know, nine to five isn't what you have to do anymore. Um, and so I think that's a beautiful thing and they're on such a great path. And if we choose to go the echo boomer way and destroy houses and mess things up, then, then we're really missing out this opportunity on growth. And that's kind of what I wanted to come across, but we'll see if it happens. I understand this is your first feature film, which is very sharp and destructive. How was that experience going for you? Dude, it was it was cool. I mean, you know, when you have people like Michael Shannon and Leslie and Warren in your first film, I mean, you just realize how blessed you are, you know, that, that the universe just kind of aligned for this to happen. Uh, and... It honestly, I'm so anxious just to kind of hear what people have to say about it. it. You know, it's far from a perfect movie, but it is one of the most fun movies of the year for sure. Now, before before you've done a, what a lot a lot of shorts, did you take any of those lessons onto a feature film like this? Oh man, I feel like without those shorts, I would have made so many mistakes. Um, and it's just small things, you know. Like I've I've learned throughout making shorts that like. Like I had a few shorts that I loved that I made, but they didn't really have a meaning or they didn't have a purpose. It was just flashy filmmaking. And so like, you know, I would make this short film that was super fun and everyone would say, oh, that was super great, but they wouldn't think about it afterwards. And you know, that taught me like when you make a film, it should really be something that sticks with someone. Um, so yeah, I feel like those lessons were super crucial. I'm very impressed that you got Michael Shannon and Leslie Ann Warren, but I'm also equally impressed that you got Alex, Alex Pettifer and um, Patrick Schwarzenegger. Talk about the rest of the cast. I mean, to, to, to have this cast as your first feature film is astonishing. Yeah, what, what we did was once, once we got Mike, we started looking at, once we got Michael Shannon, we started looking at, like, let's find the next generation of Michael Shannons. The ones that like in 10 years, when they look back at this movie, it'll look like they have, you know, five of the biggest Hollywood stars at the beginning of their career. And so it took us three years to cast just because we really wanted it to be like the perfect marriage. Um, and, you know, Mike jumped on. And then as soon as Mike jumped on, Alex Pettifer read it. Alex loved it. And then Alex brought us uh, Gillis Geary, who plays Jack. And they had worked on something previously, and Alex was saying that this kid was just unbelievable, which he is. Gillis is someone who, like, I want to put in every single one of my movies from here on out. Um, 
And then, and then lastly, Patrick jumped on and Patrick read it. And I think Patrick understood the generational message, which is kind of what attracted him to it. And, and they, they all became so close on set. It was really cool to see. I, I, I bet Patrick would actually understand that message. I mean, he comes from, he comes from that family that you definitely know there is some kind of generation gap all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And yeah, what's funny about Patrick, too, is that Patrick is one of those guys that, did I lose you? Oh, there you go. Patrick's Patrick's one of those guys that, you know, his dad being Arnold and his mom, Maria Shriver, like, he has such a good head on his shoulders, which is what's so uh, alluring about him. You're just like, he's just so mesmerizing to watch. So what was the most difficult thing that you had to do on a project like this? Ooh, uh, probably the biggest thing was just uh, was just getting it in the can. You know, we had to raise a whole bunch of money for the movie, which being a first timer is close to impossible. But um, Chicago really helped us out. You know, Chicago Media Angels came through and, and they had a big investment in the film and um, – and that was probably the hardest part is convincing these like vets of investing in movies to trust a first timer was really hard, but we got there. You know, what's actually amazing is that during times like this, indie films are like the new blockbusters. I mean, because, because with theaters um, closed, the major studios cannot get anything out. And so now we're like watching films like yours and we're treating it like big movies. How does that feel to you? Oh, dude, it feels so great. I mean, if, if this, all of this wouldn't have happened in terms of COVID and everything like that, I would have been against Wonder Woman, James Bond, Dune, and the French, the French Dispatch. <laughs> so like, it actually gives like indie movies a chance to shine. And I just feel so blessed that I get to be a part of this really small era that these indie theaters need help, right? And people still need to go to the movies and we needed to keep those theaters alive. And I'm so thankful that Echo gets to be a part of keeping the cinema alive. And and for yourself, what motivated you to become a filmmaker? I think it was one of those things that I just always kind of knew it. Like my parents were really big into theater. And so I kind of got into the theater world as a kid. And once that happens, you start seeing these performances on stage where, you know, opening night, the first scene might be the best. And then closing night, the last scene might be the best. And I wanted this art form where I could like find all the best moments and kind of marry them together. And that's kind of how it happened. And then once I put my mind to it, I was like, man, this is it. I'm going to do this forever. So so it does sound like you're definitely doing this again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, let me wrap it up with one more thing, because obviously we're, we're talking via Zoom because of the, you know, the pandemic's actually going on. But how are you staying sane and creative during times like this? Dude, now's the time to write, man. I know that I know that Echo's coming out and I think people are really going to love it. And so... Uh, I've been working on a few new projects because I know I have to have them ready to go. And I think they're going to be good. I think, uh, I think the studio system will love them. Excellent. Well, we can't wait because I heard everything's going to be reopened, uh, ne- you know, in the next few months. So it's, it'll be great times again. Yeah, that'd be great. Terrific. I really enjoyed this. In- I really enjoyed this interview. Hey, not a problem. I, I don't know how many interviews you already did. So, you know, I, yeah. I try to make it, you know, fun, fun and smooth out for a lot of my yeah. subjects. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, well, hey, you know what? Let, let's do this again another, another time. when. Yeah, for sure. Month. When the next one comes out, let's do it. All right. Thank you very much, right. Seth. Talk soon. Bye now.